Welcome to Interparty Conflict, the podcast where we answer your questions so you can have the best tabletop gaming experience possible. My name is Gabe. And my name is Jeff. And we're going to answer your questions today. But first, I have a question. Jeff. Yeah. How are you doing today? Uh, not so bad. How about yourself? I'm doing pretty good. Pretty good. I uh, just cool. mentioned to you before we started recording, um, I just recently was able to get some new arcade games running on my arcade cabinet. Oh, yeah. Um, ever since I built it, I've, I've wanted to play those Laserdisc games like Dragon's Lair and Space Ace and yeah. stuff like that. They're, they were games that had, you know, a, a, a Laserdisc, like a, a DVD basically, in the machine and it would play it would play this video and then like you would have some sort of a prompt. You'd have to press a button. Yeah. If you press the button, the video would keep playing. If you didn't press the button, it would cut to, you know, a, a failure screen. I guess. Right. It, which is, it, it's kind of interesting because there, there was a series of like when like DVDs, like home, home movie DVDs were big and there was like the special edition DVDs of everything. Yeah. There were several that I've come across where they had like, that style of game built into like the menu of a DVD, like movie sure. or something. I know like one of the Harry Potters had that were, it was like, um, it was like they were in the flying car going through the, the, <laughs> the, the dark forest and like, you're like dodging spiders and stuff like that. So sure. Be, sure. Like you'd have to, you, you'd use your remote to play, you know, the a little prompt would come up and you, it would say left or right. And you hit, you have to choose quickly. Otherwise the spider would get you or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so those types types of games, I've wanted to get them running on my arcade cabinet since I built the thing like three years ago. All right. But um, I was never able to get that. You have to have like a a big assortment of the correct files. You also have to have the emulator program configured properly. I had tried and just could not get it to work. Um, but just a few days ago, somebody in a Facebook group I'm in. Mentioned there's a website where you can, you have to uh, pay a small donation, but you, you, you pay a small amount of money and then they have all of the files already configured, you know, properly set up and everything. You download this big, this big, you know, zip file of them and then they just work. And nice. I figured at this point, it's been several years. I'm willing to pay a few dollars to get, you know, to get these things finally working. And I downloaded them and they work. Cool. So I'm I'm really excited. I still need to get them integrated into my front end program, which is like the program that makes it look like you're not using a Windows PC. It makes it look like, you know, you use a joystick to select a game yeah. and such. Um, I, I still need to get that set up, and that's probably going to be a, a bit of a headache. But I have the games. I've played them. They work. Yeah. They're not good. <laughs> you know, these types of games aren't good. They yeah, really but- are just a matter of memorization and you know very quick reflexes when a a thing lights up on the right side of the screen you need to know to press to the right or whatever right but (laughs) now i can play them yeah it's for me it was always like you know do i push up or do i hit attack what do i like you know yeah because there's like the directional buttons and then there's like an attack button so it's like am i am i attacking the thing or am i dodging the thing i don't like those games yeah those games are frustrating but they're like but I mean, Dragon's Lair specifically is just like really it looks beautiful. Yeah, looks great. It's it's good, really good animation. So one thing that I I'm actually hoping to do because we're recording this a few days before the Fourth of July. Um, unfortunately, that will have come and gone by the time this episode goes out. But I think on the fourth, I'm gonna try to uh, I'm gonna try to stream some of these. Oh so, yeah, That'd um, be good. so yeah, I, I'll post about it on social media. So again, if you're hearing this, it's already passed. Uh, presumably, but you know, hopefully you will have checked social media. I'll see if I can make it so that it gets saved on YouTube or something. Yeah. So people can, people can watch it. And if it doesn't happen, I'll cut this part out. <laughs> <You know>. Sure. <laughs> it's the magic of, uh, magic of pre-recording. Yep. There you go. So anyway, I'm really excited about being able to play those games. I'm excited about streaming them. Uh, I'm also excited about having a day off work with uh, 4th of July. My job has been a, a little bit tumultuous lately just because of of some, you know, the COVID-19 um, measures they're, they're taking to, to, you know, keep us all safe and everything. So mm-hmm. work has been a little bit stressful. But aside from that, you know, pretty everything's pretty good. I'm excited about time off from work. I'm excited about life, I, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. So, so yeah, Thank pretty you. good. Yeah. Could be yeah. better. Could be a lot worse. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, you want to go ahead and uh, get into this episode? Sure. 
Okay. And I, I do want to give a, a little bit of a disclaimer. I think this episode is going to be fairly, fairly planar heavy. Oh, okay. So if you like the planes, everybody stick <laughs> around. If you don't, uh, maybe go listen to last week's episode. <laughs> no. <or something. laughs> no, that, op- that episode sucks. No. Well, cause they've already, we've already gotten the, the download points for this one, you know, <laughs> The podcatcher has already recorded them as, as having downloaded this episode. So <laughs> keep listening, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> listeners. Anyway, um, so Jeff, I want you to imagine that it's a normal day. You know, you you went to work or whatever. You're mm. stopping at the market to go pick up some fresh fish or something. To buy a fish. Whatever. Very normal day for me, yes. Very normal day. <laughs> and then you're on your way home. And then you think to yourself, you know, I I don't usually go down this route. I usually take this this route to my left. I'm going to go down this route to my right instead. So you go down this route to your right. You go down, go down this alleyway that you're not uh, not super familiar with. And you pass under this archway that you never really paid any attention to. And when you do, you suddenly feel the entire world around you sort of like melt away. Mm. And you're no longer standing in that alleyway. You're oh. standing in a dark chamber. Do you have any sort of a, of a light source? Uh, I pull out I pull out my phone and use the flashlight. Uh, okay, feature. you turn on you turn on your flashlight, and your eyes are met by the reflection of of gold and rubies and Ooh. silver and emeralds and so on and so on. And you realize you're in a giant chamber with a huge pile of gold. Do you Whoa. know where you, you realize that you just stepped through a portal of some sort? Okay. And do you know where that portal led you, Jeff? Where did it, where did it lead me? It led you to the dragon's whore. So today's magic item was actually submitted by me. I, I kind of wanted to, because of the main topic we're going to be talking about today, I, I kind of wanted an item that fit that theme and uh, none of the ones unless I'm mistaken none of the ones we currently have submitted quite do um, and this is uh, so this is a magic item that I I actually I learned about fairly recently and I did a little write up about it and I think I think it's interesting for reasons we'll get to later in the episode today's item is the blood of Auscar Aoscar Auscar I'm not, sh- I'm not sure how you pronounce this name a- Aoscar I think Oscar, <laughs> Oscar, the blood of Oscar. It's A O S K A R. Okay. Um, Oscar, as we're going to be calling him, we'll probably have some other unique <laughs> pronunciations later. Um, uh-huh. Oscar, the keeper of gateways, was the god of portals, doorways, and opportunity. Hmm. Prayers to Oscar were whispered when his followers walked through doorways, and the use of portal keys became associated with his worship. All travel to or from Sigil, the city of doors, became a sacrament to Oscar. Hmm. Oscar desired Sigil for his own, though he was smart enough not to try and take it by force. Instead, he encouraged his followers to spread his faith throughout the city. Residents of the city turned to his worship, and he became the unofficial patron of the city. However, not to be usurped in her own domain, the Lady of Pain killed Oscar, casting his corpse into the astral plane and destroying his house of worship. Since then, his body, floating through the infinite silver sea, has been picked over by scavengers ever since. His blood, which is said to resemble wine, is sought after by alchemists and planar travelers as it acts as a universal key to any magical portal. Ooh. That's pretty neat. Yes. So, you know, light on the mechanics more heavy on the story but i think the mechanics are are a little bit you know deeper in their in their own way so the way that portals work in D&D, uh specifically you know particular campaign settings are there's there's fixed portals there are transient portals or like portals that like come and go there are also portals that are always there but you don't know that they're there because they can only be activated by a specific key Mm -hmm. A key to a portal might be a physical key that you have to insert into a door that opens up a portal. It might be a um, maybe like a magical gem that if you have it in your possession, 
will open up a portal when you reach the portal. Right. It might be you have to whistle a tune when you walk through a doorway and then that doorway becomes a portal. Huh. It might be that you have to be in the right frame of mind when you go through a portal. Sure. Also, portals aren't just, you know, the big magical, like obviously glowing doorways that lead from one world to another. A right. portal can be any opening in a closed structure. Okay. In theory, you could just be walking down an alleyway and then suddenly you're in, if you happen to have the key on you, mm. you are now walking through a portal. Right. It's like any, any sort of threshold or that sure. sort of thing. Sure. It might be that uh, that window that you always look out when you're, you know, at work or whatever is actually a portal. You just don't realize it because you've never had the right key. Sure. Maybe if you throw a ball into that barrel over there, that barrel is actually going to turn out to be a portal to the plane of fire or something. <laughs> Portals can be basically anything. And I, I think depending on who is who's running the game, anything can in turn then be a like anything can then be a portal. Yeah. So I found out about, you know, when I was reading up on, on uh, you know, Planescape and, and Sigil and Lady of Pain and all that. I found out about there was this god, Oscar, I guess we're calling him. <laughs> yeah, that, good old Oscar. <laughs> right. Um, was the god of, of portals and such. And when he was killed, his blood acts as a universal key to any portal. Mm -hmm. Mechanically speaking, I think this would probably, there probably has to be some intent. It's probably not just going to be, well, I'm holding a vial of his blood. Anywhere I go is going to lead anywhere in the multiverse. That's probably not it. Probably... I would imagine with this type of thing, it's if you know where you're trying to go and you know where a portal is that leads there. Yeah. This acts as a key to that portal. So in the hands of someone with a lot of planar knowledge, this will, this in theory could let them get anywhere. It's pretty neat. You know what this yeah. makes me think of, uh, yeah. as far as like uh, portal keys go, you know, okay. you know, it's a, you know, it's a really cool portal key. Uh, what's that? The Mighty One's cap. Yeah, that's oh my goodness, Jeff. That's the that's that's the that's the the hat that Mighty Max wears. That, in, that in is the... absolutely what that is. Yep, it's a it's 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 a it's probably a baseball cap that was uh, soaked in Oscar's blood. I, well, I was about to say it is the right color. <laughs> sure. <laughs> oh my goodness, Jeff. We have to make this. We have to. <laughs> right. We have to make a, a a Planescape campaign based around Mighty Max. Mighty Max. Yes. Well, well, we still have to. We still have to record that Mighty Max podcast. We we really do. I mean, like, <laughs> even, if there even, is ever a day that you want to set aside some time and actually do that, I'm on board. <laughs> Especially now that now that we've got uh, you know something to work with here. Yeah. Yeah. So for anybody who's, who is not familiar with Mighty Max, Mighty Max was a it was a a cartoon. But specifically, it was a cartoon that was based on a, a line of toys. Um, but it was yeah. it was a cartoon about this kid who gets this magical hat. It's a red hat with the letter M on it. And with the help of these two, you know, I'm guessing like immortal or very long lived, very wise individuals that are helping him along his journey. He finds out that this this hat can open up portals anywhere. Like there are specific portals that lead specific places. But with this hat... You know, there's doorways everywhere that can lead to other places, other, not other times, I guess, other, other places that, yeah. um, you know, lead him on these crazy adventures. It's been a while since I've seen the whole series. I can't remember if there's travels through time as well. I don't think so. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't think so. I could be wrong. There is some trickery involving time in the series, but I don't think it is, uh, hat based. Gotcha. So. <laughs> no um, hat-based yeah. time. <laughs> so I kind of love the idea of another artifact that was soaked in the blood of Oscar that gives it the power to, you know, create portals and such. I think yeah. that's, that's really cool. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, n not much more to this. We may we may talk about this more later in the episode, but uh, I just, I heard about this. Oscar isn't the, he's not the one that the, um, you know, the Lich Queen's beloved, that, that uh, adventure... I do. Hang on a second. Um, the like the city that the Githyan that her Githyanki are on, like or, that live in or whatever, is like on a on a uh, on a on the body of a god that's floating in the astral plane. It's possible, however, um, 
just because it's about like the astral plane <laughs> the astral plane has a lot of dead gods in it it's your shirt um <laughs> it, it it could be that that would be a really neat detail mm-hmm. uh however i just a, a um a quick search doesn't doesn't bring that up so i wouldn't say it has to be but it could be i'd okay. have to look at that adventure to, to be sure Anyway, so so yeah, it's the the item is fairly simple in and of itself. I like the history behind it. I mean, I'm not I'm not trying to say because I br- I brought this in. I'm not trying to say like oh praise me because I, I you know, <laughs> brought in this cool. I'm I'm just saying I brought this in because I like I like the story, I like the mechanics of what it does, and I just in a campaign that uses planar travel, this would be an incredibly valuable artifact. Mm-hmm. So so I I really like it. Yeah, that's pretty neat. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you, Gabe, for bringing that in. <laughs> Once again, that was the the blood of Oscar, and we are purposely not pronouncing the A at the beginning of that. So, yeah. Uh, um, well, well uh, it's Oscar. It's Oscar. Okay. Oscar. <laughs> uh, so, Jeff, if anybody else wanted to, uh, so that'll, that'll do it for the Dragon Sword for today. So, Jeff, if anybody else wanted to submit magic items for us to discuss, if they wanted to submit questions for us to discuss in our main segment, or if they wanted to submit stories for the uh, funeral pyre or retirement village, how would they get those to us? They could send us an email at interpartyconflict at gmail.com or join us on our interparty discord at bit.ly slash interparty discord. That is correct. And before we go any further, we have a giveaway to give away today. So uh, we're giving away a copy of Unearthed Tips and Tricks, Volume 1, courtesy of Crit Academy. Unearthed Tips and Tricks is a uh, it's a great supplement of content from the Crit Academy podcast. Um, every episode of the podcast, they have a, um, a character concept, an encounter concept, a monster variant, a magic item, a player tip, and a DM tip. And then the uh, Unearthed Tips and Tricks, Volume 1, is the first 25 of those from... Uh, from their show all compiled into one so it's got a ton of ideas for players a ton of ideas for dms tons of cool stuff for your campaign it's a great supplement i helped write it but i also believe that aside from that i think it is a great product that everybody should enjoy so we're giving away a free copy of it and jeff who is our winner of this great supplement today our winner today is the dm's council whoa 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 winner Yes, congratulations, DMs Council. You should be getting that in your email pretty soon. Uh, within, I would say, within the week. If you haven't gotten it after that, let us know. Uh, and be sure to leave Crit Academy a review. If you leave them a review on DMs Guild, Drive Through RPG, wherever wherever you get it through, if you leave them a review, it will help more people see their product. Um, hopefully, it's a good review. But if there's, you know, if there are negative things in there too, it can help them to make better products in the future. Um, so yeah please leave a review. And if, if because I did have a, a part in writing that, I also had a part in writing the second one. If you have any specific tips you want to send on to me as well, I'll take those too. Uh, in case uh, I, I hope eventually I will help them make uh, Unearthed Tips and Tricks Volume 3. We'll, we'll see about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So thank you very much to Crit Academy for facilitating this. Good job, DMs Council, for winning. Jeff, if anybody else wanted to be like the DMs Council and they wanted to win a copy of this free supplement, how would they do so? They could send us an email at interpartyconflict at gmail.com with unearthed tips and tricks in the subject line. That's correct. And next up, I want to thank all of our wonderful patrons. Patreon is an online platform where you can pledge a certain amount of money per month to donate to the creator of your choice. And uh, we have a Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash interpartyconflict. We've got a few different tiers on there with various rewards. We've got outtakes. We've got bonus episodes. We've got a, a, a monthly Roll20 game, which will probably be going on in the next week or so after this goes out. Um, So, you know, we've got some cool stuff on there and we're super thankful to all the people who have donated to us in the past. We know that uh, if you are are not able to donate nowadays, totally understand. There's a lot of stuff going on in the world right now. Your money may be more valuable than it was maybe a few months ago. So, um, you know, we understand if you're not able to support us now, however, we're very thankful to all the people who have. And again, if you do want to join in on, on that Patreon Go to patreon.com slash interpartyconflict. Check out the rewards and see if anything appeals to you and think about helping out the show. And then just one more quick thing. Check out the other podcasts on the Crit Nation Fellowship. Check out Crit Academy at critacademy.com. Justin, Ian, and Brandon create new and reusable content for players and DMs alike. Check out Brute Force and Ignorance. They are an actual play podcast on the network. And check out D&D Character Lab, where Garen and Dan made characters and pitted them against each other to debate whose were better. 
Let's get into some plainer questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Our first question uh, comes from Dustin on Discord, and he asks, what's Planescape all about, and has anyone converted it to 5th uh, edition? Yeah. So today's main topic is going to be the Planescape campaign setting. Um, a disclaimer at the beginning of this, I've never played in a Planescape campaign Unless I'm mistaken, Jeff, you have not either, correct? No, um, I feel like we we had plans to. I feel yeah. like a while, like years and years ago, we 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 kind of brought it up a few times, but we never sure. actually we never actually delved into it. Yeah, so we never really never actually played in it. However, I love it. I mean, everything I've read about it, I love. I love hearing about it. Mm -hmm. I love hearing stories about it. I love the idea of it. Yeah, but just keep in mind, we are not. We're not going to be, you know, recounting tales of the games that we played in. We're kind of just going to be relaying information we've gotten secondhand and, and so on. Sure. Yeah. So. So, yeah. Planescape is a it's a campaign setting, much like Eberron, much like Forgotten Realms, Greyhawk. Um, it's kind of just like a, a big framework of a world in which to put your characters. Mm -hmm. Now. I think Jeff and I both sort of had a little bit of a difficulty when we were researching this in that there isn't that much of Planescape that is unique to Planescape. It didn't start planar travel. The manual of the planes already existed, I think, since the previous edition of the game. Mm -hmm. But what they did with Planescape was they looked at this, they looked at the manual of the planes, and they said, hey, all these planes are really cool. What if we made a campaign setting that was all about traveling the planes yeah so uh, yeah because like it, it was like the planes are a nice space space to play in but they were like yep. let's fill these out with like an actual breathing world and not just you know not just these images of you know planes of fire and stuff sure sure so when talking about planescape you can't not talk about the planes however we we might dwell on talking about the planes themselves we might focus more on the you know, Planescape specific stuff. I don't know. We'll, we'll see what happens. But, um, you know, of course, it would it would kind of be a, a, a poor explanation of Planescape if we didn't talk about the planes in some way or another. Right. But just be be aware that the planes already existed. They weren't they weren't new when Planescape came about. However, Planescape kind of gave a lot more life to them. It, it gave a new way to look at them. Yeah. And as well as added a bunch of new stuff as well. Mm hmm. So Planescape uh, came about in um, 1994, I think, and it had an assortment of, of books that were, you know, guides to the world, guides to the city of Sigil, which we'll get to later. Um, it had a collection of adventures and such. There, there was a good amount of books you could buy for, for um, Planescape. Mm -hmm. And I'll actually, I'll kind of jump to the second part of this question right now and just get it out of the way. There hasn't been an official 5th edition um, Planescape conversion. I would love if there was. If there was, I guarantee you I would start running a Planescape game, even mm -hmm. if just through our Roll20 games or whatever. Um, I was expecting there to be a ton of DMs Guild content, like, you know, uh, user-created 5th edition Planescape stuff. There is some, but it's not nearly as as easy to find or as, like, front and center as I, I expected. Okay. So if you did want to play a fifth edition um, version of Planescape, you probably won't be buying supplements on DMs Guild. You'll probably just be like finding people's websites where they wrote about with a game that they did mm. and then going from there. That being said, like most campaign setting stuff, the majority of the content is flavor. So if yeah. you wanted to, you could get the second edition Planescape books and then make make a fifth edition version of it just by using the story bits and not the mechanics right yeah like a lot a lot of the flavor information about different campaign settings like it's spread out through the se several editions just because like you know i mean eberron's been around since third third or 3.5 3. 3. 5 edition 5. yeah and so like you know it, it's gone through fourth edition and fifth edition so you can find a bunch of information on it you just have to kind of convert it to the version that you're playing mm-hmm so, like, you know, like, we, when we were playing the, like, the Eberron adventure that you were running for us, yep. um, like, we, you know, you had out all the older books, too, because we were just, like, looking at, like, the Sharn City of Towers book and stuff, and, like, all the, yep. all, like, all the cool information on there that they, 
did probably didn't have time to put into the fifth edition book. Sure. So yeah, you, could, you there's plenty of books on the planes, plenty of books on on Planescape itself uh, throughout all the editions. Mm-hmm. So um, I think the first thing that I want to talk about is is the planes in general and how and specifically how they relate to um, how they re- relate to Planescape. Mm-hmm. So you know. As a as a listener, assuming you play have played some version of D anD D before, um, or uh, Pathfinder as well. Pathfinder, you know, ha- shares a lot of D anD D with shares a lot of DNA with D anD D. Is what I meant to say. <laughs> um, and as such, I imagine their cosmology is similar enough. Um, so the planes are different. Planes. How do you describe what the planes, planes are? Different are. planes, Gabe. Obviously, that's how I you know. Say okay, it. they they are different universes, right? It, like it is it is sort of like a multiverse sort of situation, or yeah. different dimensions, or sure. uh, you know, different settings have different ways of interpreting it too. But yeah, that's true. Like I think in in Eberron, I think they are pretty pretty directly referenced as being different planets, right? Yeah, in in a, in a way, yes, yeah, yeah. Well, so. Similarly, in um, in, so in in the the planes, I think at the time when Planescape came out, I think they've moved away from this since then. But at the time, the cosmology of the multiverse was envisioned as a great wheel. Yeah, not physically. There there are ways to physically go from plane to plane, but metaphysically, you've got a giant wheel. You've got the prime material plane at the center. Then I think you had the elemental planes right around it. Then you had the outer planes in like a big um, area around that. And then the astral plane and the shadow plane or whatever were like all over everything, I, I guess. Yeah. And so it's it's kind of confusing. But the the prime material plane, it's easiest to think of that as, oh, yeah, the, the regular world. You know, if you're playing in, in Faerun, if you're playing in the Forgotten Realms, Faerun, or I think the world is called, it's called Toral, I think, is actually what the 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 Earth is is called. That sounds um, right. Eberron, uh, in in Greyhawk, the world is called Oerth. Um, each of those is a material plane, but I think when Planescape came out, they sort of tried to imply that every material plane is a different planet in the same universe. Mm. I think because then there was also another another. Uh, campaign setting called Spelljammer that came out shortly after. Oh yeah, that explained that it is possible to physically travel from Faerun to Eberron or to Galerion or from Galerion to Oerth or whatever. They, according to Spelljammer, if I am not mistaken, because again I have not played a Spelljammer game either, um, they are physical planets separated by this like material called like phlogiston and you had to have basically a spaceship to travel between them i'm i'm sorry uh <laughs> phlogiston it's it's a thing look it up uh i'm gonna I'm, I'm i'm not making this up i promise so at some point the decision was made that it is it is heavily implied that all of the different material planes from the different campaign settings do all physically exist somewhere and those are all at the center of the planes which are all just kind of outside or whatever i i I hope any of this is making sense okay so you got the prime material and then in planescape specifically there is another plane that is is pretty relevant um for more reasons than i'll get to right now but there's this this plane called outland or the outlands or something Mm mm-hmm the the way that this was shown in in the third edition manual of the planes was they showed it as a big disc. It's not really a disc. It goes out, you know. It it goes out for an entire. It's its own plane, so it goes out for eternity, I guess. But there is a center to it, and in the center of this plane is this giant stone spire that just goes straight up, and then around the spire there are, I think it was twelve. Was it 12 or was it eight? There were a, a number of cities that all are connected to one of the outer planes. And they each one has a permanent portal that leads to the outer planes. So yeah. let's say you're on, um, I don't know, the, the plane of Isgard. And you want to ride a horse to the uh, plane of fire or something. In theory, you could. You'd have to find the permanent portal on Isgard that leads to the Outlands. And then ride from the Outlands portal 
to Isgard over to the Outlands portal to the Plane of Fire. Yeah. If that makes any sense. So like it was it is one plane that is kind of meant to be the middle of everything. If if there is the uh the 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 giant you know wheel of the cosmology, it is the very center of the wheel. Right. So you've got this big spire, you've got all these cities around it that are all kind of, you know, connected to the outer planes. But another weird thing about this this plane of Outland is that the closer you get to the center, the closer you get to that big spire, magic stops working. Right. If you're really far away, magic works fine. But if you get close enough, if you're in one of those cities that's connected to the other planes, maybe ninth or eighth level spells don't work. Yeah, that, like a higher level spells work uh, stop working first, and then and then like okay, as you okay. get to the center, like you know, first level spells stop working. Sure, sure. So in theory, if you had a, if you had access to your magic, you could just fly up to the top of this spire and see what's up there. But you can't because magic stops working when you get there. Yeah. Now it's known what's up at the top of that spire though, because at the top of that spire, this is this is real weird. At the top of this spire, in this plane where magic stops working in the very center of this plane, is a giant floating donut. <laughs> like mm, delicious. above above the top of this spire is a city called Sigil. I'm gonna call it Sigil. I think it sounds real stupid. Should just be Sigil. Yeah, but I've 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 heard many people, not just not just Gabe, but many yeah. people call it Sigil. Yeah, uh, I used to call it Sigil. Yeah, we, yeah, we used to call it Sigil. Everyone I ever I've, that I ever heard talk about it said Sigil. Even the several videos that I looked up in the you know to to learn about it, like mm-hmm. most of them said Sigil. And then yeah, there was one video where I watched. Then they said that he said Sigil, and then a later video he said Sigil and a po- and like. <laughs> and apologized for saying sigil right. but i'm like no man you're fine <laughs> like yeah generally speaking i like to call things i like to pronounce things correctly generally yeah. speaking oscar notwithstanding <laughs> <laughs> so well, oscar's oscar's dead floating in the astral plane well, so it's fine. there so he's not standing anywhere uh, <laughs> so if if there is a definitive this is the correct pronunciation i'm, I'm i'll call it the correct pronunciation for sure if I, i'm just, aware of it it's just sigil sounds better it i don't really like, does it, it's, it's like sigil it just sounds odd yeah anyway so there's a a big city that is is inside i called it a donut because the city is shaped like it's called a, a torus i think is the mathematical term for this shape but basically picture a giant donut that's hollow on the inside um Weird little tangent here, but you know, in like a video game, like an RPG where you're flying around an airship, Mm -hmm. you know how the map is always a square and then it connects. If you get to the edge of the square, it just connects to the other side of the square. Sure. That's actually a torus. That is not a sphere because if it was a sphere, it couldn't be a square and the, the corners of that square wouldn't touch each other. Gotcha. Yeah. So anyway, so Sigil itself, I was about to call it. Sigil. Sigil itself is this giant floating city that is really weird spatially, but it is floating above the spire that is the the middle of the outland. So part of the impressive nature of that is that means whoever created Sigil or runs Sigil or whatever is powerful enough that even in this place where magic shouldn't work, Sigil Everything works fine. Magic works in Sigil. You can't teleport in and out of Sigil, but you can teleport from one part of the city to another part of the city. Mm-hmm. The only way in or out of this city, because you can't climb up this, this spire is like miles and miles and miles straight up. You can't use magic to get up there. The only way in or out of Sigil is to use a portal. Like I said, there are maybe portals all over the multiverse that lead you there. There are tons of portals in Sigil that lead everywhere else. Um, But the thing about Sigil is that if you don't know what you're doing, you are trapped there. So a lot of people refer to the city as the cage. Right. Yeah. It's all, it's, it's kind of like a prison. Yeah. And I don't know how much we'll, we'll get into it, but there's a lot of lingo surrounding Planescape. Like a while ago, I I read, I read there was a, one of the Planescape, 
uh, supplement books was called In the Cage, A Guide to Sigil. I read most of that book a long time ago. I also read there's an event, one of the adventures I read um, about it. And they are written in such a way that they are constantly using this lingo. And you kind of have to just like pick it up as you go, similar to if you were actually living there. Uh-huh. Um, so I, I like the lingo that they use. They they call gods powers instead of gods. Mm. Um, they, I feel like a, a lot of the, the slang is based on like old British slang. So like they'll, they'll call you a Burke, like, Hey Burke, <laughs> come here. Sure. <laughs> um, also one, one thing that I thought was interesting about, it's really just kind of about the planes, but again, uh, Planescape kind of emphasized this is that in in the world, when you're when you're tr- planar traveling, there are different types of people. Um, there are people that are native to the outer planes. So, like if you're on, um, let's say you're on the the plane of Celestia, like one of the you know the plane with angels and stuff. The angels are native to that plane. They're not from the material plane. They're born and raised on these other planes. They are adapted to whatever um, effects that plane may have. If you're on the plane of fire. Ifrides and salamanders and such don't need protection from fire because they are born of the plane. Yeah. There's also people from the material plane that have traveled there. And there are different terms for these. I, I'm, I didn't write them down and I, I don't feel like looking them up right now, but um, they're so people from the material plane that have traveled elsewhere. Usually those people do need some sort of magical assistance in some of the planes. You would need fire resistance or you would need an ability to breathe if you're on the plane of water or whatever. But then there are also what are called petitioners. And petitioners are the souls of people who died and went to their god's plane. Hmm. So if you worshipped the good gods that live in Celestia and after you died, your soul was deemed worthy to join them, you wouldn't become an angel. You would become sort of like a... How do you even describe it? You would become some sort of a separate being that you're not really your full self. You would probably be in service of your deity. But if you encounter, if you are a person from the material plane and you go to Celestia and you encounter a petitioner, the petitioner isn't going to remember their past life. They might not even remember that there are other planes like their their consciousness is kind of limited to my understanding. Okay. And. You know, like if you were, if you imagine like someone going to hell, like from like Dante's Inferno or whatever, the people that are being eternally tortured in hell, those are petitioners. Right. So like if, if you were going to a good, uh, a, a good aligned place, you would probably be in service of whatever willingly or whatever. If you went to a, a, an evil aligned place, you would probably be tortured or yeah killing things or whatever the heck petitioners do there. Right. You don't want to be a, you don't want to be a partitioner for carcery. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Um, so you don't, I don't think you'll ever encounter petitioners in Sigil, but it, it is a thing that is important to mention when talking about Planescape, because yeah, if you're going to be traveling the planes, you're probably going to run into these types of, of people. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, so you've got Sigil. Sigil is big city. There are people of all types there. You might see, you literally might see a demon sitting at a bar, sitting next to an angel, just going about their own business. Oh, yeah. Like in uh, Good Omens. I haven't seen, I, I'm not familiar with Good Omens. Oh, it's, it's a, it, it's a, it's a pretty entertaining book. I haven't, I've, I've, I've gotcha. not watched the uh, Amazon series, but. Okay. Uh, yeah. I didn't realize it was a book. I knew it was a, some sort yeah. of a series. Yeah. Um. So the thing about Sigil is that it's kind of a common ground. For uh, it's, it, it is purposely a common ground. There is a force that is keeping it a a, a neutral ground. Mm-hmm. So if you show up and you start trying to wage a war against someone else that's there, bad things will happen to you. Oh yeah, very bad um, things. <laughs> I guess I guess I'll go ahead and 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 mention this power that is in charge of Sigil, possibly created Sigil, possibly created more than Sigil? Question mark. There is this entity known as the Lady of Pain. Ooh. And if you have seen the like Planescape logo, you've probably seen her face. She's right. represented as in in universe she is seen as this very very large woman, does not speak, does not really do much. She kind of just like floats around Sigil. 
and you do not want to encounter her. You do not yeah. want to get <laughs> you, on her you, bad side. You don't want to be near her if you can you, help it. You, yeah, you just know you want no interaction with her whatsoever. Yes. And she kind of it is it is purposely left vague who she is, what she's capable of, and why she does anything that she does. But yeah. she is attributed with number one, Sigil's existence. Number two, uh, the fact that magic functions in Sigil. She's also attributed with the fact that, I don't think I mentioned, gods are not allowed in Sigil. Right. A cleric can be there, but again, if you show up in Sigil and you start fighting someone that is of a rival faith, the Lady of Pain is not going to like it, and you are most likely already dead. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we'll, we'll go into the way the the effects she has on people later. Yes, but. <laughs> yes. Um, but a lot of Sigil is a very weird place. It it has a a finite space, but supposedly, if she wills it, the city will get bigger. Because it's it's kind of it's so jam packed. Because this is like a planar metropolis. Mm -hmm. This place has so many people living there, but because it is a relatively limited space. That means that like you'll see buildings on top of buildings, buildings squeezed between other buildings, mm -hmm. people living in, you know, absolute squalor, but they would rather live there than live anywhere else just because it, there's so much opportunity in Sigil, I guess there's right, so much yeah. utility from being there. Um, it's used as, uh, a, because it is a neutral ground, a lot of people use it to make business deals. Mm -hmm. Because they can do so knowing that the other person isn't going to stab them in the back. Maybe at least until after they leave, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, like you're, you're more or less safe. I mean, I don't, I don't know how safe you are there, but like in Sigil, but it's like at the very least, you're not going to be outright attacked, you know? Like sure. It, sure. It's, it, it's going to take a lot of guts for somebody to well, do that sort of thing. They might attack you, but they won't attack you for religious reasons. Sure. Or, yeah, or, or like, faction reasons. You'll, you'll have a, you have a, well, I was going to say you have a better idea where people stand, but actually I feel like you have less of an idea where people stand because because when you're when you're talking about an angel versus a demon, you know where they stand, but in Sigil you don't know, you know, it's like you, you don't know exactly what's going to happen because everyone's just kind of hanging out together. Yeah. I just I really like the the setting of Sigil because any kind of story can happen there. Mm -hmm. It's jam-packed with colorful characters it's jam-packed with mystery it's jam-packed with intrigue there's danger at every turn there's you know there, there's there's refuge to be found at every turn at any point things could be completely turned upside down and if you know whatever your dungeon master is is interested in doing with it sigil can function for exactly that okay i came up with an idea um what's that? i'm on sigil i want there to be um there is a there's a gym like a like a fitness gym, okay, and it's uh and the, and the uh, the lead fitness trainer is an illithid and he's super buff, <laughs> okay. There's just uh, he's just he's just a personal fitness trainer for uh, people in Sigil. I mean that works, <laughs> you know like <laughs> that that's that's uh yeah that's what I want. He like he helps he helps people get buff. <laughs> that's pretty good. Yeah. Um. So I uh. I might get into more of it later, but I, I think I mentioned to you last week, actually, Jeff, off off mic, that um, my my only experience actually playing anything Planescape is there is a a very well known video game called Planescape Torment. Yeah, it was, I believe, in the Baldur's Gate engine. I, I think. think so. Yeah, um, but it was you know it's it's an older mm. computer game, but it's recently been ported to everything. You can get it on the Switch. You can get it on Steam. You can get it on... I think you can get it on Steam. It's definitely on on GOG. Uh, but anyway, it's it's a pretty good game. I've never beaten it. I'm kind of embarrassed. I, several times I've tried to play this game. I've enjoyed every second of it. However, I get to a point a few hours in where I just lose all interest. And I don't know why. Because it's totally my jam. Anyway. <laughs> but... Uh, in, in because it takes place entirely in Sigil, or at least what I played was entirely in Sigil. There is a bar, I think, called the Burning Man, or like the no, the uh, Smoldering Corpse, or something. Yeah. The whole premise of this bar is that you go inside, and there is a dude on fire 
in the center of this bar. Mm-hmm. Apparently it was like a mage that tried to cast some epic spell to incinerate his enemy or whatever, but it backfired. It incinerated him, but also trapped him and revitalized him to the point where he cannot die because the spell that is burning him alive is keeping him alive. <laughs> right. And nobody can interfere. The, the magic was so powerful that nobody can do anything about it. So they just built a bar around him and he <laughs> like, is the main attraction. Like, the, <laughs> like, what is that? Who, who came up with that idea? Who was like staring at a man burning in agony for all eternity and thought, I should build a bar. <laughs> no idea. But in the game, the there's so much like background audio that is you're probably not even going to hear most of the time. But if you stand in this bar, you can hear a barker who's like, come and see the man that's on fire. He looks so thirsty. Why don't you buy him a drink? <laughs> so good. That was pretty good. Yeah. So all sorts of interesting characters and such can be encountered in in Sigil. Um, I just, I love that it's a neutral ground. I love that the gods are not allowed there because uh, we mentioned, um, Oscar, the, you know, the, um, the God of portals, you would think, oh, surely he can get into Sigil, but he can't, he's not allowed there either, but he (laughs) wanted it. And so he, he tried to convince, you know, he convinced his followers to start converting everyone in the city to worship him. And again, the lady of pain who purposely keeps out religion and or or keeps out religious affiliations and such Mm -hmm. she put an end to that by killing the god yeah and like unless i'm mistaken it's not like she squared off and fought him she just willed it and he died yeah (laughs) it's crazy Uh, so there's like there's a few things that the lady of pain does yeah um like basically if you try to interact with like if you see her floating about don't interact with her like just, and if you try to you, you, yeah like if you try to like most people just end up dead like like yep. if she if you even if she even looks at you you're basically gonna erupt in pain mm-hmm. uh um there's also like the like the whole maze thing yes uh, uh if like, she chooses not to kill you she right. might send you to an extra planar maze where you may never escape unless she lets you out. Right. It's so it's it's it is a it is like a you know little demi plane prison and it's a maze yeah. that like potentially you'll never get out of. Yeah. There is um in one of the videos I was listening to there was there's an NPC in one of the Planescape modules or whatever that uh she's a, I think she's a tiefling. If if I'm not mistaken, tieflings were introduced in Planescape. I hmm. could be wrong, but I also know that tieflings were not what we picture now as tieflings. Tieflings were basically just people. There's, uh, sorry, they were just humans or they looked like humans, but they had some, some trait that made it clear that there was something demonic about them. It wasn't that they had red skin. I mean, maybe some of them had red skin. Maybe some of them had a horn, maybe two horns, but like some of them, it might just be like, oh, they have like, 10 fingers on one hand or something like that. Hmm. So anyway, there's an NPC that if there is someone incredibly down on their luck and they are willing to do anything to get money for another drink or whatever, this NPC will pay them to go and anger the lady of pain. If the lady of pain doesn't kill them and instead sends them to a maze, she then, you know, this, this NPC then offers them like, if you are, if you are sent to a maze, if you can make a map of that maze, I will pay you handsomely if you ever get out. <laughs> and so the idea being that if this NPC can get enough people to do this, in theory, they would eventually have maps that would let people escape the mazes. Theoretically. Huh. Right. Who knows if that's even how it works. A lot right. of the Lady of Pain stuff is intentionally... 100% mystery. You right. Aren't yeah. aren't really meant to know almost anything about her. Right. I, I mentioned here earlier that it did. It's, it's very refreshing to have something that's not fully explained, like in a yes. book somewhere, you know, it's like th- there are plenty, there are, there's plenty that is known about the lady of pain, but sure. But like major, like, but, but mo- for the most part, nothing is explained. Like it's like, yeah. there's you, her interactions with the world can be, you know, seen and witnessed, but 
for the most part, we have, like there's no one knows where she's from, what she is, mm-hmm. if she's a she at all. Like, sure. you know, it's just this entity. Like, is it, is she a God? Is she something more, you know? And she's called the lady of pain. That's the lady of pain. Isn't just like, Oh, just a clever name. Like she engenders pain in people that anger her. Right. Supposedly there, there was some story that I heard in a, in a video that was that like, there's some legend that um, she once got pissed off at a stone golem and made the stone golem cry out in intense pain as it died. <laughs> like a mindless creature, a mindless automaton that cannot feel pain. She gave it the ability to feel pain <laughs> she, as she killed it. She gifted it with pain. Exactly. <laughs> so, um, yeah. There's also the, uh, the there's also the thing where like if but like you can't even you can't even worship her she doesn't even allow that correct <laughs> like, people who have tried worshiping her ended up like their like flesh started to rot off or something yep <laughs> yep yeah it's uh, like it, terrifying like, it's such a terrifying and cool like thing about 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 Planescape like you know that's yeah. there's there's a reason why she's like the logo. Yeah. Um, she also has, uh, she has these like little helpers that, um, they're called, I'm not sure. This isn't a word. I'm not sure how it's pronounced. I always assumed they were called, uh, the Dabas, hmm. but I've heard some people call them the Dabus and Dabu singular, like Dabu is the singular, but I'm not sure of that. Anyway, Dabu. um, this is a, the grammar cast, I guess. Uh, <laughs> but she, so she has these, these beings that she has created presumably that their, their role is to like repair Sigil. If somebody, let's say one day somebody tried to like, I'm going to dig a hole and see if I can dig a hole to the outside of Sigil. Number one, she would kill them and or send them to a maze to stop them. But also if there, if there was a hole in the, in the way, you know, if they left a hole, she would send some of the, the Dabas or whatever to go repair it. Mm -hmm. Um, The Dabas float. They don't walk on the ground. They don't talk. They communicate through images. Mm. Um, but there is, uh, there's another thing from one of the modules. This was also an NPC in Planescape Torment. One of the Dabas started worshiping Oscar. Mm. It voluntarily chose to not be a Dabas anymore. It started walking on the ground and I think it started talking. I could be wrong. Huh. Um, and for some reason, the Lady of Pain didn't kill it or send it to a maze. He's still out there. Uh, people call him Fell, is his name. Okay. And so in Planescape Torment, like, you can meet him. He gives you tattoos that give you special powers. Oh, neat. But, like, people, anybody who's not interested in him giving them tattoos, because that's a thing he does, uh, give him a wide berth because at any point he might get blown up by the lady of pain or something. And nobody else, nobody else wants to get caught up in that. Right. Yeah. Like it, like everyone assumes he has like the most reason for the lady of pain to come after him. So they're like, we're just going to stay over here. <laughs> yeah. Like don't want to get between the lady of pain and somebody she's mad at. Sure. Um, there, there's one more thing. I don't really have a lot to say about it because I would just, Base, I've, I've never experienced, I've never played the campaign, so I would just be reading off a bunch of facts. So I'm not going to say much about it, but I would, I have to mention Planescape is also very big on factions. Um, from what I understand, it is a very big part of the campaign setting is that as you travel the planes, there are these factions that are very strongly tied to some sort of a concept. They are at war with the, you know, some of them are at war with other factions and, and so on. Again, I don't have personal experience with them, so I don't want to just read a list. I'll, I'll read the names, I guess, but I don't want to just like sit here and read paragraph after paragraph of something that I've never experienced. Sure. But um, so there there are these these factions that if you play in a game are presumed to be a big deal. You may join one of the factions. A party member might join a different faction. And so a lot of a lot of the published adventures that came out for Planescape involved these and I'll, I'll get to more of like the published adventures in a minute so there are the athar which are also called the defiers or the lost i think they fight against the gods or something like they mm. something about the gods they're believers of the source also called the godsmen there's the bleak cabal or the madmen the doom guard 
which are also called the Sinkers. One that I do have any experience with whatsoever is the Dustmen. They kind of revere the dead to the point where, like, in the game Planescape Torment, they run the mortuary that the game starts at. Okay. So they they are in Sigil, and they they take care of all of the dead. They cremate them and and so on. Okay. Um, there's the Faded, which are also called the Takers or the Heartless, the Fraternity of Order, the Free League, the Harmonium, the Mercy Killers, the Revolutionary League, the Sign of One, which I, I thought they were particularly interesting. Their whole ethos is that everyone is the center of their own reality. And mm. in theory, they believe that all reality can be reshaped by your imagination. Huh. Which is kind of cool. Yeah. Um, and then there's the Society of Sensation, the Transcendent Order, and the Chaos Attacks. I think it starts with an X, but I think it is Chaos Attacks. So they're all about chaos. So there are a lot of these factions. And again, I don't have much experience with them, but I've heard many videos and such that are like, oh man, the factions are, that's what Planescape's really about is these factions. Mm. Now I will mention, so there were, I think about 10 or so published adventures um, for Planescape from second edition. However, the what I've understood to be quote unquote, the problem with Planescape is that it's pretty self-contained. If you were to play through all of these adventures, most of the mysteries of Planescape or most of the conflicts of Planescape would have resolved themselves. Mm. Like a couple of them deal with the factions and eventually, if if my understanding is correct, eventually all of the factions basically disband after a certain point. Mm. And so if you're playing in a campaign that is all about the factions, you would probably want to stay away from those adventures because then, you know... I mean, you you can you can intentionally let your campaign go in a different direction, but if the whole enjoyment comes from we want to keep playing with these factions, you might not want to let that be dictated by the published adventures. Yeah. So I read most of one of them. It's called Dead Gods. It's like the second to last one, I think. And I think it dealt with finding the corpse of Oscar. It's been a mm-hmm. long time. I could I could be wrong, but. Uh, some really, really cool stuff in there. Like I, I love even just looking through the Planescape books because they're they're just so evocative with the the pictures and the the terminology and stuff. I love it. I love Planescape. If I had if I had any way to actually play in a can a Planescape campaign, I might even say Planescape is my favorite campaign setting over Eberron. But I've actually played Eberron, and I can <laughs> say firsthand how good it is. So. Eberron's still number one for me. Sure. <laughs> um, if you do want to play something that is Planescape, though, I highly, highly, highly recommend Planescape Torment. I know I said I've never finished it. I cannot tell you why. It's not because it's a bad game. It's a great game. So play it. At least watch a <laughs> video of it or something. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I, I kind of threw a lot of a lot of info out there, but... <laughs> I, I love Planescape. I think it's it's so cool. I would love to play a game in it. Yeah. Yeah, the the planes in general are always like really cool and fascinating because there's just so much potential. Yeah. Uh, I really wish they would uh, I would love if the next um the next campaign setting that they came out with was a an updated Planescape. Yeah, that'd be really neat. You know. I mean, there's lots of other ones that are worth, you know, that are worthy of getting remade too, but like th- this is the one I want. Right. So. Um, yeah, so I, I think that'll do it for our, our regular questions for today. Thank you, Dustin, for giving us an opportunity to, uh, to, to gush about, about Planescape, I guess. Um, I'll put some videos in the show notes for, um, information about Planescape. Cause like, seriously, it's so much fun to listen to so much fun to read about really cool. Um, so that will, uh, that'll do for our regular questions. That'll bring us to our social media questions. Our last social media question was, what is your favorite aspect of tabletop gaming? Do you recall your answer, Jeff? Uh, uh, I guess just the versatility, really. Okay. There's... I think I think your answer was the table. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. The table. Yeah. Yep. It's, you know, it's got legs. It's got a surface. Yep. Uh, no, the versatility, I think I would agree with. Just the fact that you can do anything. 
when I first ever played a role-playing game, I was shocked at the fact that it's not just I press a button to attack and then I just attack. If I want to say, oh, I'm going to try to trip the guy, if I want to try to to grapple him, if I want to throw my sword at him, yeah, I can do that. If I want to not fight at all, if I want to negotiate with this guy and, and you know, figure out some peaceful solution, I can do that too. I'm not going to, but I could. <laughs> right. Yeah. There is that option. <laughs> yeah. It's just, it's, it's so awesome. It's the power of imagination is my favorite, my favorite part, I think. Um, so we got uh, a few responses over on Facebook. Jake F says, I really enjoy the tactility of games. Not hundred percent positive. That's a word, but maybe it is. Uh, collecting and showing off favorite dice. Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry. I thought he was talking about the tactics. He's talking about the tactile sensation right, yeah. of it. So I think that is a word. Good job, Jake. <laughs> collecting and showing off my favorite dice, holding well-crafted components, shuffling decks of cards, and admiring minis and meeples. There is a warm feeling to touching and sharing components that aren't digital. Yeah. yeah totally agree. Um, I love handouts. Like I love uh, physical things to bring to the table. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sean M says community through all this. I miss friends hanging out at a table, talking about our weeks, having dinner and playing games for fun. Yeah, definitely. Definitely understand that too. Uh, over on Reddit, we just got a couple. Um, El Jahue says, I mean, smiting bad guys is pretty fun, but for me, it is definitely spending time with my friends, even virtually, especially in these weird COVID times. They're my support network. Alistar the Minotaur says, I could say it's the number crunching and character creation, and that's probably, and that'd probably be true. I could say the good times and the laughs I make with my friends and sometimes strangers, and that would also probably be true. But I am, at my core, a storyteller. As a player and also as a DM, nothing drives me like telling a compelling narrative. The plight of the hero, the redemption arc, the villain laid low. Memorable characters, over-the-top set pieces, mustache-twirling big bad guys, and conversations that end in giggle fits drive me more than anything else to keep coming back. D&D is the quintessential, you'll get back what you put into it, hobby. And when I'm running a campaign, you can bet that I'm scheming and plotting like a Machiavellian Sun Tzu in the days leading up to the session. Hmm. There you go. Well said. Yeah. Uh, on, uh, on Twitter, the beverage tea says the table. <laughs> and then he also said uh i hear that jeff and i are on the same wavelength <laughs> then he posted that before and after listening to to that episode good <laughs> um kara karn says it's definitely the companionship i get from meeting with my group of friends and i can't wait for our first in-person session since the lockdown since the lockdown started so long ago i agree i 3d printed a whole bunch of terrain at the beginning of the lockdown when i assumed we would only be down for two weeks <laughs> right. And uh, no, still, still all sitting on my table. Yep, so. one of these days. Yeah, Seawood Scribe says favorite thing about TRPGs has to be number one, laughs and memories with friends. Number two, the legendary end of campaign moments you'll always remember when a campaign lasts long enough. And number three, pizza night. <laughs> yep. <Yeah. laughs> Blank Scroll says getting together with friends to be unapologetically nerdy. With D&D, it's the shared story aspect. It's such a nice change of pace from how video games are so limited in scope, story, and world-wise. Yeah. Qualywood Squares says, With D&D, I love the opportunity for creativity it provides. Every moment allows you and your friends to do literally anything in-game, and that has led to some amazing scenarios play out that could never have been written ahead of time. As an example, in my first campaign, I've already had some moments that are as memorable as any from my favorite video games like my unseen servant dousing an overpowered enemy with cooking oil so we could grapple her and not die. The truly <laughs> open world gaming is engaging. There you go. Hmm. And then over on Discord, E. Thompson 03, easy, the fellowship. Sitting around laughing at something ridiculous that just happened in game or getting so deep into topics you forget you're playing a game and need to refocus. Uh, Damien the DM says, the friends we made along the way. <laughs> Dustin says the camaraderie. It feels great to escape the tedium of life together. Go on an adventure with your friends and leave the world behind. Just a couple more. Uh, Joe S says, I honestly like seeing people who aren't always the most outspoken in a group, who aren't always the one to try to make the plan that is very risky work out. 
and who are sometimes the ones who feel like their voices aren't heard as much as other people's come together in a group without judgment and throw their proverbial hat in the ring. If it weren't for groups of people like those that play D&D, there would be no Ninja Turtles or Comic-Con. <laughs> Creating groups of friends where we can let our imagination and creativity out is one of the most freeing things I've ever experienced. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, just one more. Floofy Shoob says, exploration. I wish I could say camaraderie, but I always seem to be traveling with such weirdos. <laughs> there you go. Uh, yeah. So good, good answers all around, I yep. think. Um, so that was our last social media question. The next social media question is, go, again, going with uh, this week's theme. If you could set up a permanent locked portal anywhere in the world to anywhere else in the world, where would you put it? Where would it lead? And what would the key be? Mm. So if you could put a portal, you can set the starting point, you can set the ending point, and you can set one thing that has to be done or possessed in order to go through it. Mm -hmm. What would all those things be? Uh... Anywhere in the world or anywhere in the universe? <laughs> Let's just say world. World, because, you know, who knows what's actually out there. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> now, hold on, Jeff. If you put it out in space, it's going to suck all of the oxygen out into space. <laughs> right. Yeah. Did like, you not like see Portal, Portal 2? 2? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, Spoiler for Portal 2. It's a great game. Go play it. Yeah. Uh, that's actually, that's a, I mean, that's a big question. Like, yeah. If I, if I had to pick between two places... Oh, I I don't I don't know, man. Because like, you you'd want to have like one close by, but if you move anywhere, then yeah, that's true. Are the portals fixed to that location? Like, could could one portal be like I don't know, like a hula hoop? You know, <laughs> I I guess however you want to answer it. If you want it to be a hula hoop, it can be a hula hoop, right? So I could just have I have a hula hoop that that if I if you if you swing it the right way you can get it get it you can activate the portal and it takes you to like i don't know like a like a nice like lakeside cottage or something okay <laughs> just like i i would i would want a place that would just be away you know like just a sure just a nice little like kind of cottage sort of thing that way like no matter what no matter where i am i could just be like I'm going to take an hour and go sit by the lake for, you know, just, just for an yeah. hour. Yeah, no, I, I understand that. Um, I haven't put a ton of thought on this, but I, I, I would probably do something similar. I would probably put, I would have, I would have the, the side on my end, at least be a fixed place. I would just have it be like in my basement. Cause I plan on being in this house till I die. Sure. Um, and I would, my gut reaction is to say I would want the other side to be somewhere near my work because I have a huge commute. So cutting <laughs> several hours off of my commute every, you know, every workday would be, would go a long way to make my quality of life better. Yeah. Um. However, I, I don't know. May, maybe if I, if this actually happened, I probably wouldn't do that because like, yeah, what if I don't have that job anymore? Right. Um. So maybe I would put the other side like, I don't know, where we lived in Tennessee was really nice. Maybe I'd like to go go there and you know sit by a lake like you said right yeah just a little 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 nice little easy vacation sort of portal thing yeah i would say uh the key though because i don't want anybody just walking into my basement they would have to be wearing a gabe shirt <laughs> <laughs> right yeah of course <laughs> yeah <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, so that'll do it for our questions for today but before we close out uh let's let's relax let's take a deep breath <sighs> let's remember those who have come before us who have uh, made the world a better place made the multiverse a better place <laughs> by by their own sacrifice as we toss another log onto the funeral pyre and so today's funeral pyre was actually I'm bringing it in I had another one but uh it, I, I just thought of one that actually is very similar to the one that I would have brought in, but also is relevant to the episode. Um, this didn't happen to my character. I was running this adventure. It, it happened to Chris's character. Dang. Our good friend Chris. Mm -hmm. Or it, it involved Chris's character, but it took place on the plane of Outland because I was running an adventure that had to do with the players were traveling to the plane of Acheron, which is... Uh, this 
it's like a lawful evil plane where these giant cubes of metal are flying around space, smashing into each other. Anyway, there was a point in this adventure where Chris is Chris and our other friend, Melissa, they had just made new characters because this was right after um, Ichi got put in jail. And then Chris and Melissa's characters got killed trying to break him out. So after this, um, they had made new characters. They were in this one of the towns in Outland that was going to lead them to this outer plane. And there was a point where they got to the portal they needed to go through. And Chris's, Chris thought it would be funny. I think his character's name was uh, Kale. Kale thought it would be funny to push the other character through the portal. Like, mm -hmm. you know, they weren't, they weren't sure, like, oh, is this portal safe? And he just pushed her through. Uh-huh. Well... She was playing a uh, neutral evil assassin, and they had just met, so there wasn't very much uh, wasn't very much camaraderie between them. So she was like, "Okay." She waited on the other side of the portal to kill him once he walked through. <laughs> he walked through. She attacked him. He he saw fit to attack her back. The two of them fought for a little while. Eventually, he killed her. Oh no. And I'm as the DM, I'm just sitting here like I'm very I was very a very new DM. I was like, I have no clue what to do, guys. Right. And so what we ended up doing, because Chris admitted this was just a goof. I was just pushing her through the portal because I was just goofing around. I think he blamed her, she blamed him, but Johnny, one of the other uh, players who was all you know, he was our he was all of us were DMs. He he said what he thinks should happen is because it was a goof, but Chris did initiate it. We retconned it so that nobody died. However, in those campaigns, we always played where um, each of us had a free true resurrection. We played it that Chris had to give up his true resurrection because he basically got somebody else killed. Sure. He, okay. he got somebody else killed for an out of game joke. Gotcha. I guess. So, you know, I, I think looking back, I think that was, that was a fair call probably something that could have been the whole thing could have been avoided had i had the wherewithal to be like whoa whoa hang on guys are you actually doing this you know right sure but hey you live and you learn um so i i guess today's funeral pyre i guess we're raising a glass in memory of chris's free true resurrection which um tells us to quit goofing around <laughs> clink <laughs> All right, well, that'll do it for today. To submit questions for us to discuss, items the Dragon's Horde, or stories for the Funeral Pyre, please email us at interpartyconflict at gmail.com. For show notes, links to media mentioned on the show, and running lists of questions and magic items, go to interpartyconflict.com. You can join the discussion on social media. Find us on Facebook, facebook.com slash interpartyconflict, on Reddit at r slash interpartyconflict, or on our Interparty Discord, or on Twitter at InPartyConflict for our weekly social media questions. Your answers might end up on the show. You can find us on iTunes, Google Play Music, Stitcher, YouTube, Spotify, iHeartRadio, anywhere you download podcasts. Please rate, review, subscribe, or just tell a friend. If you'd like to support the show, check out the rewards at patreon.com slash interpartyconflict. There's a few different tiers, so anything you can spare, even a dollar a month, would go towards making the show better, and you'll get bonus content for it. Jeff, tell us about FriendQuest. FriendQuest is a YouTube channel where you can watch us play video games. Yes, and uh, if I ended up doing my arcade stream that I was thinking of, it will be on the uh, FriendQuest ch channel, yeah. I think. Yep. Yeah, I'll I'll try to have it on the FriendQuest channel. So cool. if this is after the fact, which it definitely is, uh, check check the FriendQuest channel to uh, see if, if I was able to save it. Yep, sounds good. Uh, so speaking of uh, video games and arcade games specifically, check out my side project, the Arcade Memories Podcast. If you'd like to submit your own childhood memories of going to the arcade, record them or write them to me at arcadememoriespodcast at gmail.com. Also head over to bit.ly slash interbreadconflict to take a short survey about our show, what you like, what you don't like, etc. And just for taking it, you'll get two free printable board games courtesy of Mary and Tom over at hollandspiel.com. And our music is made by Boxcat Games from Nameless the Hackers RPG. So, Jeff, until next time. Hey, Gabe, I just found a portal to the next episode. Oh, snap. <laughs>